Imagine a pool in which we put a system of two pulleys that move a belt to which we glue plastic balls filled with air so that they float. Then we build a waterproof barrier in the middle of the pool and fill the right half with water while the other one is left dry. When it is completely full, we release the brakes of the two pulleys little by little. The floats on the right, pushed by the water, begin to rise, while those on the left, attracted by gravity, fall. It's very slow at first, but with a little bit of time, the speed increases until it is enough for us to put an electric generator, and voila, we have infinite energy. Or maybe not. Hi, and welcome to S for Science. Mankind has been searching for what I call the holy grail of the first law of thermodynamics since the Middle Ages, the creation of the so-called perpetuum mobile. Objects that do exist. One of them creates energy out of nothing, others simply conserve it, and others it's impossible for them to work in this universe. Let's go back to our pool. What's happening here? What's the trick? Why don't we have generators like this in our houses? Well, because we're poor and we don't have swimming pools. Just kidding. Not even the richest escape from the first law of thermodynamics, synthesized and applied in this case, would come to tell us that the energy of an isolated system does not increase or decrease. It remains constant. It's conserved. In the example of the swimming pool, that for practical purposes we can consider an isolated system since the energy of the sun is negligible, Movement is appearing, that's energy apparently from nowhere, causing it to stop being constant. So the first law of thermodynamics makes the existence of this machine impossible. And you would think, okay, that's what the theory says, but I don't see why it shouldn't work. Is this one of those exceptions that do work? Well, no. Just like 99% of the perpetual mobiles that have been devised. In this specific case, what happens is that the necessary energy that is spent to push each one of the floats inside the water, it's exactly the same as that generated by the push of the water on the ball that is coming out. And to this we have to add the friction of the water and the air that would remove from the system, in the form of heat, any energy that is applied to it. For the same reason that car brakes get hot when braking. But the imagination of the human mind is fascinating, and so many centuries trying to outwit the laws of thermodynamics have paid off, creatively speaking. With the creation of amazing inventions that at first impression would seem to work, but they all have the same problem, that the energy they apparently generate is spent somewhere else in the system. This one is one of my favorites, a little different. Supposedly, the great mass of water should push the water with such force that it would allow it to reach higher than the original reservoir, creating an infinite and free flow of water, and perpetual motion where you could put a pinwheel to get infinite energy out of it. The problem here is that the pressure exerted by a mass of water does not depend on its mass or volume, but on the height of the water column. The pressure exerted by this column will allow the water to rise to the maximum height of said column, a phenomenon that is responsible for the existence of Artesian wells. Sudden emanations of water in the middle of dry places, without lakes or rivers nearby. What we have here is an aquifer, a mass of water trapped between rocks, whose maximum height of the water reservoir is higher than the height in which we find ourselves. If we pierce the rock, the water will reach the maximum height of the water column that little by little will be decreasing as we spend the water. It would look like magic, infinite energy, but we will only be balanced in the system. But it's fascinating how it seems that the universe takes care of everything perfectly so that we don't cheat. So all of these examples are of no use to us. But we are so close. If friction didn't exist, we would achieve it, as long as we did not extract energy from the systems. The energy in the system would remain in compliance with the first law, so we would effectively have perpetual motion. But we're surrounded by air, water, and machines with cables, gears and oil that cause a lot of friction. However, in this universe, 
there are fascinating exceptions. There's a ball that has been spinning non-stop for years, floating in a vacuum, and with a very special configuration so that gravity doesn't affect it. It's been doing it for millions of years, in fact. However, the Earth is still not a perfect perpetual mobile. It almost is, but it's not. Because some of the rotational energy is lost slowly with the exchange of moment with the Moon. In other words, that the energy of the tides is not free. And although much more slowly, the translation around the Sun is also wearing out the orbit of the Earth with the emission of gravitational waves for what we could say that the Earth is almost a perpetual mobile. And that almost is applicable to the rest of celestial bodies that make up the cosmos. These are the objects that would be the closest to a real perpetual mobile. Without an almost, we could imagine a more extreme case like that of a rogue planet, a type of planet that were ejected from their galaxy and wandered through intergalactic space. If this planet was positioned in a very specific area halfway between two galaxies, their gravity would cancel, so the planet could stay there without having to orbit them, avoiding spending energy in the form of gravitational waves. But this would be like holding a marble in the tip of a pen. Any disturbance, no matter how small, would destabilize it. For instance, the redistributions of mass that could occur within galaxies would slightly modify the equilibrium point and sooner or later would cause destabilization. Because you, just moving your arm, are already modifying the center of mass of the Milky Way. So only with this, you would already wobble the tip of the pin. So in reality, only a photon traveling through a flat and empty universe or a body rotating in a universe that only consisted of that same body could be considered a real perpetual mobile. But does the falling tree make noise if no one hears it? What makes noise is the G2 flywheel of the NASA, the closest thing to a perpetual mobile that mankind have created. It is a very unconventional energy storage system. Simply, it is a very heavy wheel that rotates very fast inside a box in which there is no air, so the friction is very close to zero. That's why there's no noise, there's no air to propagate it. The friction is so low that it takes years for the most precise instruments to detect changes in its speed. What this device is about is essentially a battery. But it doesn't store energy in the form of chemical bonds like conventional batteries do, but in the form of angular momentum, that is, in the form of rotation. If the mass of the wheel and the speed of rotation are moderately high, these batteries can become much more efficient than conventional batteries, in terms of occupied volume and total weight, which is why NASA is evaluating them as possible batteries of the future. To extract energy from them, you just have to connect a dynamo to the axis of rotation, and to store it, you just have to make it rotate faster. Very nice and very fascinating, but we came here to talk about how to create infinite energy. Well, you may be interested in knowing that pure vacuum has infinite energy. That is to say, that although you would be able to isolate a piece of space-time completely without an atom and at absolute zero, this vacuum would always have a minimum energy level, the so-called vacuum energy, which, although it is quite small, we have been able to extract it. This is called the Casimir effect, in which two metal plates located in a box with a perfect vacuum are attracted to each other, not by electromagnetic effects, since they are electrically neutral, nor by their gravity, since they are too small for it to be appreciable. They move by this vacuum energy that, simplifying a lot, creates a disturbance in the quantum fields that push the two plates together. They come together and do not separate since the space between them is very small and the disturbances that appear between the two plates are much smaller and weaker than those that appear between them and the wall of the container. In a way, we could say that space-time by itself, it's an infinite energy generator. The problem is that we don't know how to take advantage of it and we suspect that it is something impossible. In the case of the Casimir effect, once the two plates have been put together and the energy is used, you need to spend the same energy separating them so that they can be put together again. In the rest of experiments that manage to take advantage of the vacuum energy, the same thing happens, that the net energy obtained is zero. 
which is why many authors consider that the vacuum energy can never be used to extract infinite energy. Because for the moment, everything indicates that it is faithful to the first law of thermodynamics. But hey, a promise is a promise. If you want to get infinite energy, I'm going to tell you how. And look, it's going to be free, so you can't complain. Today's tutorial is free so that you can buy the pool. What you need to do to get infinite energy, it's just to wait. Wait a little bit, but quite a bit. Specifically, 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 56 years. The time necessary so that through quantum tunneling, another Big Bang occurs. Assuming that the universe is infinite, an isotrope, something that evidence seems to indicate, the Big Bang is the only moment during its vast history in which infinite energy was created out of nothing. And the most accepted theory for now predicts that there could be infinite Big Bangs given the necessary time. If that seems too long to you, we will see in another video how to create a time machine. Until then, remember that patience is the mother of science. Thank you very much for watching the video, and goodbye. Thank you.